Twyla, get back here. <laughs> Hi, Jason. <laughs> ben, you have something to share? Just as long as the green light's on, it should be good. Yeah, keep it down. Yeah, there it is. That should be on. Testing, one, two. As everyone gets their seat, I don't have, Dan asked if I have something to share, but um, I don't, I'm like Chris. If I get started sharing my testimony, it might be a while. <laughs> but the one thing that I would share out of my testimony is, um, I was going through like a really difficult struggle as um, a young Amishman. Um, my wife and I were married and we were about roughly 27, 28 years old. And I was riding my bike to work. And I remember of a, a crossroad, you know, the crossroad of life. And I realized that there were people being excommunicated from the Amish church I was going to for, for simply studying the Word of God. They were, they were having Bible studies, and they were, being, they were being told that you can't study the Bible too much, or you're going to become more wise than the leaders, and you won't be obedient, and, and different things like that. And so there was a crossroad, and I was working with these guys that were excommunicated, and I had to make a decision what I was going to do. And as I thought about that, I, I remember those three-mile bike rides became really precious. You know, when you leave a, a setting that I remember my banker called after we left, and he said, you know, your, your homeowner's insurance has expired. Um, you're no longer insured by the Amish church. And... Um, I remember at the time, my father-in-law had given us a farm, and um, he said, I want that back. i give you the farm back. If you're not going to be Amish, give the farm back. And, um, wow. and he was gracious. We worked it out, and um, it was okay. But um, to... I guess the simply I could put it is my burden for uh, my children and any young person or older person is um, there was a uh, got a little rabbit trail here, but there was a book written about my my family when I was at home called Plain and Amish. And my brother and I are sitting on this concrete water tank. And the writer, he was a little bit of a comedian, but he was also studied Anabaptist history. And he, he on that uh, title, underneath that picture, he, he wrote that these two, two young men, uh, I was like 14 and my brother was 16, he said these two young men are sitting at the edge of the Anabaptist water trough. He called it an Anabaptist water trough. So... Jump forward 15 years later. Yeah. <clears throat> Amen. You 
it was a very similar water trough. You know, some people talk about the fetal position, like just... Sorry, my emotions sometimes. Amen. Yes. But it's where I learned to give up. I, th I think that's what it was. Um, if I could put it in a simple language, you know, sometimes people, we make the gospel too complicated. And it's just where, you know, there was all this, this decisions, like there was a business, there was a farm, there was, there was a job, there was all these things that were on the line, on the sacrifice, on the altar. And I tried so hard to make it all work out so I could keep all that stuff. And I tried, and I tried, and I talked to the ministers, and I would talk to my cousins that were being the rebels of Bible studies and all that stuff. And, and I tried so hard for so long. It was like a year, but it seemed like uh, eternity that I was trying to get people to compromise and come together. And that day at, the, at, that, at that water trough, bending over, is where I gave up. Yeah, thank you, Lord. And then God could work Amen. and he worked it out so beautifully you know Amen. better than I could ever imagine praise God thank you Lord <clears throat> thank you Lord yes wow if you're sitting here and you had to make that decision at one time in your life it was either you know get born again um, or your family as, as, as Amish, that's, that's how it works in a lot of Amish communities. I was blessed not to be part of one of those, even though I did grow up in an Amish community. It was different. They're all a little bit different. But, Ben, God bless you so much. Isn't it amazing what God uses at times? To, to, he, he, it comes back in a full circle for us. And so <laughs> I praise God. Thank you for sharing your testimonies. And I just want to invite anyone that is sitting here that is not born again, God is wanting your heart. Today is the day of salvation. I can remember sitting there in the church setting in the Amish, and these Amish preachers would get up and say, promise tomorrow. We're not promised tomorrow. And I'd sit there and I'd just be shaking. Uh, what would happen in my life if I left tonight and I'd not given my heart to Christ? And, and I understand that was, there was a lot of condemnation that went along with that as well. But in order to get born again, the Spirit of God draws us closer. He, he draws us into Him and and he wants us, to, he, he has created you to be his child. And so today is the day of salvation. What is salvation? It's being saved, born again, John chapter 3. What must we be, remember when Jesus met Nicodemus there and he said, you know, Jesus said in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. And Nicodemus goes, huh, what do you mean? I have to go back into my mother's womb and be born again? No, no. God says he changes a heart of stone into a heart of flesh. Gives it. Brother Ben, I don't know that I ever want to hear you apologize again for your emotions. It's a sign of a soft heart, and God is working in your life. It's, I, I, believe, I believe men of God that are walking after God's heart will cry often and all the time. <laughs> Their hearts are soft and pliable to God. That's what he's called us to be. And so uh, I thank the Lord for that. But I want to share, I want to share here with you all what I feel God has laid on my heart. Um, Ron and Twyla, thank you for coming today. It's so good to see you. I mean, if anyone's familiar with cross court basketball, he's the he's that's where I would have met this man, and we've kind of connected 
ever since, yeah, you know, it's basketball, it's sports. Yeah, I know God even uses that, okay, to connect me to people, and you've been a blessing in my life. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. And Ron goes over to uh, Uganda, I believe, and preaches and teaches the Word of God, and so that was a connection there as well. So thank you for being here today. It's just an honor to have you with us, and the regulars as well. Thank you for being here. Dave is back, the new papa. Can we give him a hand? <laughs> I'm still waiting to meet the newest member of our church. She was born about three weeks ago, or two weeks ago. I'm sorry, Dave. <laughs> she was born two weeks ago. See, time flies so fast when you're having fun. So um, <laughs> we, have a, we have a new member of the church that I've not met yet, and, I would, and I'm going to at some point. So um, let's get into the word here this morning. Uh, we all know that Pastor Robert and Lily are at the camp this week. Tonight, this evening, camp starts for the youth from 12 to 15. We are maxed out in the camp, so we'll be there. It's going to be a busy week, so keep that in prayer. The theme for the camp this week is undivided. Um, we talked about that a little bit in Sunday school. What does it look like to unify the body of Christ, to come together as a unit? Amen, Antonio? <laughs> Why don't we see more miracles and healings and things happening in our midst? I mean, there's too much division. Too many theories out there. Busying ourselves and other things other than the Word of God. And it was stated in the Sunday school room, if we would all get into the Word of God, that draws us together. Doesn't the Word of God draw us together? Doesn't the Word of God bring us together as one in the, as, as a unit? That's what unity is. It's a unit. It's as one. It's what we should be as a church body, as the church as a whole in America. And you see divisions everywhere. And we wonder why the church is powerless. It's divided. It's divided. And so we come together in the Word of God and see what God has for us today. And if you want to put a title on the message today, it would probably go down something like this. And if you all have probably figured out I'm not real huge on titles or anything of that nature. But as I look at what this part of Scripture, of what God has laid on my heart this morning, it would be, do you trust the God that's inside of you? Do you trust the Spirit of the Lord that's inside of you? Okay, and I want to get to that, and I want to, you know, I want to read a little bit. We've had testimonies, and it goes along with testimonies that were shared, that God has saved these people. If you're sitting here and you are born again, then you've had an, a so-called an experience. You've had an encounter with God in all His glory. You've had an encounter with the Holy Spirit, and your life has changed. Okay, and I want to iterate that really. I want to, I want to get, a, I, I want us to get this point. I know that we have a lot of things. If you say the sinner's prayer, it's all going to be okay. Yes, it's okay to say the sinner's prayer, but if your life doesn't change, there's something missing. Because I've never seen a life that has met God and has been the same, Ron, ever. Yeah. It just doesn't happen. And so when we say that we, well, I'm born again, I'm a Christian, I said the sinner's prayer, but I still walk the same way that I did before I said the sinner's prayer, I'm going to be as bold to say that you're not born again. You're still walking in that old man. You're still walking in that old nature. And we have to take this to consideration into our spirit that when we meet God in all His glory, remember, He didn't go on the cross so we can just continue to walk in the ways that we've always walked. He went to the cross to shed His blood that we could be victorious and we could come together as one. We don't need to be divided, folks. God did not intend for us to be divided. He has created us into His image that we can fellowship with Him through the Spirit of truth. And in order to understand the truth, we have to get into the Word and see what the Word of God says. Instead of watching CNN and Fox News and everything else that's going on. Huh? Huh. 
I was convicted of that not just too long ago when I sat there and watched these Fox News. I was all wrapped up into it. And the more I watched, the more my spirit died. And, and I was like, Lord, what is going on here? Well, I was more interested in what was going on than was actually into the Word of God. And hear me, it's wise to understand what's happening, but my affections were not on the Word of God at that time. It was more on what was going on in the world and with the presidency that was around 2020 and things that were happening then. So I had to go back to the Word of God. And the Word of God will always bring life. The Word of God will always bring unity. The Word of God will always draw us together. Very seldom do I see a theory out there that draws us together. But yet we spend time and time in trying to figure out what theory is true and what isn't. Huh? <laughs> God has the greatest word of all times, my friend. Yes. Amen. And so let's get into the Word of God and see what He is saying to us here today in Acts chapter 3, verse 12. We understand in the, fir in the first part of the back here, this lame man was sitting there and we've harped on this lame man for quite a few Sundays already and what happened with him and what was going on for 40 some years he was laying there. And then Peter and John comes along filled with the Holy Ghost and power and, and uh, says, I don't have silver or gold, but what I have I want to give you, and he was healed. And so we're going to start with that. We understand that this man was healed. Amen? There was a miracle that happened. There was a miracle that happened to this young man. And so here he was. And so when Peter saw... Or let's, let's read verse 11. Now as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So after the lame man was healed, can you imagine he's laying there for quite some years and then he was healed and, the, and Peter and John came there and the word of God would say that he held on to these men. And I imagine it was quite a ruckus going on there. He was holding on to this man because his life had changed dramatically. Do you see what I'm saying? That when the power of God comes in our midst, our lives are changed dramatically. And here was a man that was lame. Here was a man that was, couldn't walk until somebody full of the Holy Ghost and power came and offered him the right hand and said, what I do have, I give you. Arise and walk, my friend. That was physically... This young man was physically. But as I look at the church world, and I have to ask myself, even for myself, how many of us are spiritually disabled to walk forward with God with where we're at in life? We can all see the physical disabilities that we have. We can all see how we look. Some of us look better than others, and some look different than others. Obviously, praise God. Amen, Ben. We, can, we know when someone has a broken leg and we can all see that, but do we discern the spiritual disability that we're actually walking in? Do we need an encounter with God to understand that what, <laughs> that what we're walking in needs to change and when we come face to face with God in all His glory, all that disability leaves because God is greater. And you look at this man physically, that happened to him, and who brought this word to him was Peter and John, and so he hung on to him. And it, they hung on to him. Isn't that human nature? That when somebody comes and prays over, over someone and they're healed, you're like, oh... I prayed over Chris, or Chris prayed over whoever, and they were healed. Well, I'm going to run to Chris for healing. I'm going to run to this conference because I heard there was great healings and happenings there. I'm going to run there. Yes, there is great healings and happening in places, but do we trust the Spirit of God that is within us to activate that? Why is it not happening here? Why is it not happening within us? If the word of God is true and we are born again, walking by him and with his spirit, then that tells me these things should be happening within us. We don't have to run to Chris. We don't have to run to Dave or Ron or any of those people because it's here within us and we can pray. Do you trust the spirit of God that is within you? Do you trust that amazing grace that saved a wretch like me? Do you trust the spirit of God 
what he has done in your life. God in all his glory. Remember last week we talked about stepping out in faith. Do we trust God to allow to have our faith strengthened? Because I dealt with that this week. There were some decisions that came up that I was like torn and here and there. And what are people going to think? Yeah, I, I deal with those thoughts, Chris. I do. What are people going to think? Depending on what decision I make, what are they going to think? What do you call that? The fear of man? Let's just be honest. It is, amen? And then if you go into the Word of God, the Word of God would instruct us that we should obey God rather than man. But the decision that you made couldn't have came from God because it doesn't look like something I would have done, huh? Have we thought of this? But when we walk in the fear of God and God gives us direction in life, I can promise you some of the things that we do and walk in are not going to be normal. It's just not going to happen. But it's okay. Can we say it's okay, Dennis? Yeah, we can say it's okay to walk in that. And just because, <laughs> just because things have been around here like they have been for 40 to 60 to 80 years, maybe God wants to change some things up. Are we okay with that? Are we okay with what God wants to do with us? We say we want to see signs and miracles. I say I want to see signs and miracles and wonders and healings and everything else. What is it going to take to get to that point? Are we willing to pay the price? Are we willing to submit ourselves to Christ? Are we willing to walk with Him in surrender? And come together as one body. Come together as one unit. Verse 12, and so when Peter saw it, he responded to the people. Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us? As though by our own power or godliness, we had made this man walk. And so here they were looking. Peter asks them a question right away. Why do you marvel at this? Why do you look so intently at us? Why are you looking at us? Wouldn't we look intently at somebody if, <laughs> if there was a miracle that happened? We look at him and say, whoa. But Peter's saying, why do we look at man? Why are we not looking towards God? God only used me. And so here, Peter had an opportunity to witness to them about Christ. Peter had an opportunity here. And uh, you look at some of the commentaries, it says that Peter never turned down an opportunity to preach to the people. <laughs> he saw an opportunity here of what was happening. And he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share the gospel of, of Christ. And then we go on. And if you ever notice about Peter in the Word of God, it doesn't ever seem like he backs down. He just pretty much says what's on his heart and what he feels God gives him. Amen? And there's no way around it. It's just, a, it's just, it's just who Peter was. And I, and, and I look at the, the life of Peter, and, and I'm amazed. But he says in verse 13, The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate, who he was determined to let him go. And here Peter is telling him, the very God that you all denied, the very God that you gave up to Pilate, this is, this is the works of God. This is His works. This is who He is. This is the one that you denied. This is the one that you gave up to be crucified. And I looked at that part of Scripture and I had to search my own heart. What part of my life would there be any denial against who God is? Was there any part of my life that I'm denying what God did on the cross? Is there any part of my life that is not totally surrendered to Christ? If, it, if what I'm walking in, is it of God or is it my own agenda? Or is it my own thoughts? Or is it my own theories? Or is it... I look at that, is it... When we come against what God wants to do or what God is doing, 
is this very thing happening? We're crucifying. We're putting them back on the cross. And I look at that, and it just brings the fear of God into me. And I, and I, and I shudder, and I pray to God. I, I prayed to the Lord that everything that I do and say and read and hear from you would bring honor and glory to you, and your heart is revealed in everything. Please, Lord, let me not deny Christ in all his glory. And here Peter was saying, that you denied him in the prayer, but you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. Here they chose a murderer over the Son of God. We all know the story. If we grew up in churches, we understand what happened here. He said you chose the murderer over the Son of God. The murderer to be granted to you. Let him go free. Crucify Jesus. Crucify the Messiah. Let the murderer go free. We, 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 we look at that, we look at that what was happening. We understand it was God's plan that Jesus be crucified, Jesus go to the cross. And this was all in the plan. Yet these people denied Jesus in, in, in all the, and, and here Peter is saying he called him, first of all, he called him the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You hear that often in the in the Old Testament. Amen. You hear that it's referred to in the Old Testament quite a bit. And then he says, the God of our fathers. He calls him that. And then down in verse 14, he calls him, you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murder to be granted to you. You killed, and then he calls him, you killed the Prince of Life whom God raised from the dead of which we are witnesses. And his name through faith is his name has made this man strong whom you see and know. It's through the name of Jesus that has made this man strong. It's through the name of Jesus that has made this throne. It's the name above all names, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And last week we talked about faith. It says, yes, the faith which comes through him has given him the perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And I know we've had this discussion before. I've had this discussion with certain people. Why do some people get healed and why don't some people get healed? Why does God heal some and God doesn't heal others? Well, is it because of lack of faith? Well, you didn't have enough faith. Well, you didn't have, you didn't have I would be very careful with that statement. I would be very careful with that statement, looking at someone that has prayed over someone that doesn't heal, and you look at him and say, well, there's no way you could have enough faith. Be very, very careful with our words. This morning it was even mentioned in Sunday school about the words that we speak. Either we bring life or death. And I noticed at times, for myself, I was very convicted of that. It seemed like I could respond to someone in a very spiritual way, but it was done in sarcasm and it wasn't done in the right way and it, was, and it brought death. But it sounded good. <laughs> But here it was. <clears throat> Through faith in his name has made this man strong whom you know and see and has given him the perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And you all may be sitting here wondering, well, why doesn't some people get healed and some others? And I'll say it again, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't. I, I don't know. What, God's ways are much higher than mine. God chooses me to heal and others, and he chooses different ways to heal. But to look at someone and say, well, you didn't have enough faith to be healed, I'm very, very, very careful with that. It seems to bring condemnation on the person and questions even if they're born again. Yet now, brother, and I know Paul or Peter is still speaking to the crowd here in verse 17. Yet now, brother, and I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. They did it in ignorance. If you go into Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, it would actually say, My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge because they rejected knowledge. I also will reject you from being priest for me because you have forgotten the law of your God. I also will forget your children. My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. 
because you have forgotten the law of your God. And here it says, you did it in ignorance, also, as did also your rulers. But these things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ would suffer, he has thus, he has thus fulfilled. He has thus fulfilled. <laughs> God has foretold by the mouth of his prophets that the Christ would suffer, and he has thus fulfilled. Verse 19 says, Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Here Peter's saying you need to repent. And we've often talked about this word repent. That's what happens when we get born again. We repent. We change the way we think. We move away from the old. We're a new man. We're new in him. We don't continue in our old self. We don't continue the old habits. We don't continue the same language. I will never forget at the time that God saved me. Just a little part of my testimony working over at Volcraft, Nucor in the steel factory. I would say words that were not they're not churchy words, okay, Sharon? You just don't say these words, not even in church, but you just, you, you, you just, you just start cursing and, you, and, and it just comes out. And when God came down and met me 2008, May 20th of 2008, Chris, I'll never forget it, not at this altar, but it was one just like it. I was sprawled a crossway, and the next week I went into work and someone, someone actually made a statement to me like, um, they, 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 they heard this word come from me. They, they, they misunderstood. And I, and I was like, no, I don't, it's not within me anymore. I don't, need, I, I don't even want to say that anymore. I don't even want to do what I used to do. Because God, is, God has changed my life. He's blotted out. He's changed what I used to be. The old man is gone. Now I'm his. And if it's not within us, I promise you it will not come out. It won't. It always amazes me for myself. I referee basketball in the, the Christian Church League, Christian Church League basketball in Harlan. It's amazing, Ben, with the, some of the Amish there, you know. And basketball brings the best out in people every time, Chris. It does. It never fails. And then if you're a referee, you don't know anything. <laughs> and every call you make is not right. But these, but these, they act totally different on the court than they, or they act totally different outside of the court than they do. And they, they come up and they have few choice words for me. These are Christian people. These are Christian people and they have choice words and they, and they have all these kind of things. And then afterwards they feel bad and they come up to me and say, oh, Dan, I, I, I'm so sorry. That's not me. That's not me. And in reality, yes, it is you because it's in there. It's coming out. And in the times of adversity and trouble, things will come out of your life if you don't take care of them before you get there. And it could blow your testimony. Oh, that's a tough one. Be cleansed today. Today is the day of salvation. A soft answer will always turn away wrath. And when those guys come up to me and they, they and I, I'll, I'll never forget it. This guy, he was, he was a pretty big fellow and he came right to my nose and said, boy, you just, you just don't know what you're doing, do you? You're not qualified to do this job. This is basketball again, you know. And they, they come up to me and I said, and I just looked at him and I said, yeah, you know, I probably missed that one. I'll try to do better on the next one. Disarmed him right there. Boom, gone. But I will tell you, it was not always like that. I made enemies out there before God convicted me of this stuff because they weren't going to tell me I was wrong. And then I got, so then I got convicted. Well, what if I am wrong? Does it matter in light of eternity? Enough to blow a testimony? It, 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 and so you look at that. If it's not within you, it can't come out. It's purified. It's born again. Repent of your ways. Repent of what you are. It's a turning away from. It's much more than a just, I'm sorry. It's much more of a, I'm just sorry. And if you come up and say, I'm sorry for what I've did, and you do it again, it becomes a choice. And so then that for there's not repentance involved in your life. I've never seen anyone that has truly repented and they continue in that. I haven't. It doesn't work. It doesn't happen. The Word of God says that when we repent of our ways, we turn away from and we walk the other way. It's a complete 180, and we walk away from what we have been. 
But a lot of times we want to schmooze things over and say, I'm sorry, but continue in. That's not repentance. That's a watered-down version of it that is not of God. And I believe there's traps there that hold us in that church people anyway, but I look at that and he say, verse 20, that he may send Jesus Christ who has preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Verse 22, for Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear the prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who followed are, uh, follow uh, as many as have spoken have also foretold these days. You are sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, In your seed all the families of the earth will be blessed. To you first, God having raised up his servant Jesus, send him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. Do we trust, church, I want us to get this here today. Do we trust the spirit of God that is within us? Do we trust that when we pray over people, and we, do we trust that God is there with us and walk in the fullness of that, walk in the salvation that God has given us? We've, we've testified of that here this morning. If we remember the, if you remember the seven churches in Revelation where um, the third, second or third church, I believe, what was the, what was, what, what, what did they have against them? They did everything right. They, they looked right. They did everything. They were spiritual. Everything was happening for them, but there was one thing that was against them. And they had lost, what? First love. How does that happen? I want to implore us today to stay in the word of God, hear God's voice, move with him, walk in the spirit of what he has called us to be and who he is. Because that is our God, that is, that is who he is. Pastor Tim, would you come, man, if you want to have, please. We're just going to bow our heads at this time, hear from God. I'm not asking, if you want a prayer, raise your hand, I will pray for you. Um, if there's anyone here again, I don't believe that we can ever ask too much. If there's anyone here that is not born again, today is the day.